Welcome to Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman. President Biden visited Buffalo, New York, Tuesday, three days after an 18-year-old white supremacist shot dead 10 people at a supermarket in the heart of the black community. Biden denounced the attack as an act of domestic terrorism and described white supremacy as a poison. Look, we've seen the mass shootings in Charleston, South Carolina. El Paso, Texas, and Pittsburgh, last year in Atlanta, this week in Dallas, Texas, and now in Buffalo, in Buffalo, New York. White supremacy is a poison. It's a poison <laughs> running through our—it really is. Biden's trip to Buffalo comes as more details emerge about how the gunman spent months plotting to carry out the mass shooting. Multiple news outlets are reporting the gunman used the online platform Discord to share details about his plot with a small group of people about 30 minutes before the massacre. No one saw the messages is known to have alerted law enforcement to the imminent attack. In Texas, police have arrested a man in connection with last week's shooting at a hair salon in the Koreatown neighborhood of Dallas. Three Korean women were injured in the shooting. Authorities are investigating the shooting as a hate crime. The suspect's girlfriend said her partner had delusions about Asian people. A new report by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco and Firearms and Explosives shows there's been a massive surge in guns made and sold in the United States over the past two decades. The number of guns produced in the U.S. has jumped from about 4 million in 2000 to over 11 million in 2020. Demand for semi-automatic handguns has grown the fastest. By one count, there are now over 400 million guns in the U.S. That's more than one gun for every adult and child living in the country. Voters went to the polls for primary elections in Pennsylvania, Kentucky, Oregon, North Carolina and Idaho on Tuesday in Pennsylvania. State Senator Doug Mastriano won the Republican gubernatorial primary. He's a far-right politician who is endorsed by Donald Trump, an election denier. Mastriano took part in the January 6 protests outside the Capitol and funded charter buses to take supporters to Washington, D.C., ahead of the insurrection. He's long claimed Trump won the 2020 election. If Mastrano wins in November, he could appoint Pennsylvania's next secretary of state to oversee elections. Pennsylvania's closely watched Republican Senate primary is too close to call. Television doctor Dr. Mehmet Oz, who is backed by Trump, has a narrow lead over hedge fund executive Dave McCormick. The winner will face Democrat John Fetterman, who defeated Congressmember Connor Lamb, even though Lamb had been endorsed by much of Pennsylvania's Democratic establishment. Fetterman, who is currently Pennsylvania's lieutenant governor, had to miss his victory party Tuesday night. He suffered a stroke Friday and spent Election Day in a hospital where he had a pacemaker implanted. In other races, the progressive candidate Summer Lee has declared victory over Steve Irwin in a closely watched congressional race in Pennsylvania, but the race has not yet been called. Irwin received major funding from APAC, the American Israel Public Affairs Committee, and the Democratic Majority for Israel. Lee is aiming to become the first black woman to represent Pennsylvania in Congress. In North Carolina, the Trump-backed Republican Congress member Madison Cawthorn lost on Tuesday. The 26-year-old was seen as a rising star of the Republican Party, but his campaign faltered following a number of scandals, including allegations of insider trading. Meanwhile, in Kentucky, Charles Booker has won the Democratic primary for U.S. Senate, becoming the first black candidate in Kentucky to win a major party nomination for Senate. He'll face Republican Senator Rand Paul in November. We'll have more on these races and other results from Tuesday after headlines. Finland and Sweden formally applied to join NATO today, ending decades of neutrality. NATO Secretary General Jens Stoltenberg described the event as a historic moment. And I warmly welcome the requests by Finland and Sweden to join NATO. You are our closest partners, and your membership in NATO 
would increase our shared security. If NATO approves Sweden and Finland as members, it would more than double the border between NATO countries and Russia. Current NATO members share a 750-mile border with Russia. Finland alone has an 830-mile border with Russia. In news from the Ukrainian city of Mariupol, the Russian military says nearly 1,000 Ukrainian fighters surrendered in total this week at the Azovstal steel plant, where they'd been holed up for many weeks. Ukraine's not confirmed the numbers of fighters who surrendered include members of the far-right Azov battalion. Ukrainian officials have called for a prisoner swap, but some Russian politicians are calling for the soldiers to be put on trial or executed. The New York Times reports talks to end the war in Ukraine have collapsed, with Russian and Ukrainian negotiators further apart from an agreement that at any other point during the war. Russia claims Ukraine still has not responded to a draft peace agreement it submitted April 15. The Times reports Ukraine has been bolstered by a flood of weapons from the United States and its allies. The U.S. Senate is expected to vote today to approve an additional $40 billion in military and economic aid to Ukraine. Meanwhile, leaders of France, Germany and Italy are publicly calling for negotiations to end the war. On Friday, German Chancellor Olaf Scholz wrote on Twitter, quote, there must be a ceasefire in Ukraine as quickly as possible. He made the comment after a call with Russian President Vladimir Putin. Last week, French President Emmanuel Macron told the European Parliament Europe's duty should be to achieve a ceasefire, not wage war with Russia. The Italian Prime Minister Mario Draghi has also embraced pushing for negotiations to reach a ceasefire. Bloomberg's reporting the United States is preparing to offer India $500 million in military aid as part of an effort to reduce India's dependence on Russian arms. India is currently the world's largest purchaser of Russian weapons. President Biden is expected to meet with the Indian Prime Minister Narendra Modi next week at a summit in South Korea. The Pentagon's decided not to hold anyone accountable for an airstrike in the Syrian town of Baghouz in March of 2019 that left as many as 70 women and children dead. Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin ordered a full review of the attack after The New York Times disclosed details of the strike last year. According to The Times, the death toll was almost immediately apparent to military officials, with one legal officer flagging the attack as a possible war crime. But the Pentagon covered up key details about the strike. The bombing was carried out by a classified special operations unit known as Task Force 9. Pentagon Press Secretary John Kirby spoke Tuesday. We're admitting that, yes, we killed some innocent civilians, women and children, in 2019 in Bagu, Syria. It's all out there for you to see. We're admitting that, that we made those mistakes, that we killed, uh, that our operations ended up in the killing of, uh, of innocent people. The U.S. Treasury Department's eased some sanctions on Venezuela's oil industry as part of an effort to increase oil supplies to Europe. Bloomberg reports the agreement could also eventually lead to the U.S.-based company Chevron resuming operations in Venezuela. The announcement comes just over two months after the Biden administration sent senior officials to Caracas. U.S. officials say the sanctions were lifted to promote talks between the government of Nicolas Maduro and opposition leaders. The Justice Department has asked the House Committee investigating the January 6 assault on the U.S. Capitol to hand over its transcripts of witness depositions, but the panel has rejected the request. The chair of the panel, Congressmember Benny Thompson, told reporters the depositions were the property of the committee. And a new study in The Lancet's Planetary Health Journal finds pollution kills 9 million people across the globe annually, with the death toll attributed to emissions from cars and industry rising 55 percent since the year 2000. The study claims pollution kills approximately the same number of people per year as cigarette smoking and secondhand smoke combined. And those are some of the headlines. This is Democracy Now!, democracynow.org, The War and Peace Report. I'm Amy Goodman in New York, joined by Democracy Now! co-host Juan Gonzalez in New Brunswick, New Jersey. Hi, Juan. Hi, Amy, and welcome to all of our listeners and viewers across the country and around the world.